more pizza. There should be some left over. Thank you all for taking time out of your very busy schedule. I know we're getting close to finals coming out and listening. This is a great opportunity that this law school has. I'm very uh, excited to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Josh Blackman. Um, he's going to be joined by comments from our own Professor Ilya Soman, who I'm sure to this audience needs no introduction. He's our constitutional law professor here at Lucky. <laughs> and George Mason, um, he's going to be providing some comments after uh, Professor Blackman gives his presentation. Uh, professor Blackman is an associate professor at South Texas College of Law. He's the author of this new book, Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare. Highly recommended. Um, it's a really fun read. It's an interesting narrative of how this whole thing came about and developed and eventually culminated in uh, the Obamacare decision at the Supreme Court. Uh, Professor Blackman, as I mentioned, is a graduate of George Mason School of Law, so this is familiar territory, home turf for him. On the other side of the building, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. He also uh, blogs at uh, joshblackman.com. So without further ado, all right, thank you so much, Andrew. And that's the other Your love. All right, thank you so much to everyone at SFL and Andrew for organizing this, and to my former professor, Ilya Soman. I did for property, not Hamlet, which probably explains why I met so much this book. So have you so are these a lot of students Ilya? So have you studied NFIB v. Sebelius yet? Okay. Well I'm not in class, obviously. Have, have, have you read uh, Sebelius yet? Have you did have they done the commerce clause yet? So most of these people are not the people who have taken Con one with me, so they're probably carrying. Okay, all right, so I, I I can manage. Anyway, <clears throat> so everyone's heard of Obamacare, right? Everyone knows the gist of this law. This book will tell you the story that you don't know. This book will tell you the story of how the challenge for Obamacare came about. And this law is really a story of all three branches of government, the executive, legislative, and the judicial branch clashing over the Constitution. And it was a Constitution that had to decide a matter of great import, which is the issue of health care. Okay? Health care is very expensive, and for many years, uh, the United States government tried to take various approaches to fixing this problem. So this is my age litmus test. Who knows what this is a picture of? Hillary Care being yes, yes, Hillary Care. This is a picture of Hillary Care from the early 1990s. And you might recall that First Lady Clinton was uh, charged to join a task force to try to make health care affordable. And her proposal was effectively single payer health care. But what doomed Hillary Clinton is this. Okay, this is a tough one. Who knows this, this picture? Andrew? That's Harry Louise. Harry, Harry Louise, good. So these were actually commercials aired in the 90s against Hillary Care. And this you have your average ma and pa from the Midwest, and they're worried. It's actually kind of funny. What were they worried about? That they couldn't keep their health care. They couldn't keep their doctors. <laughs> they want the insurance company. No, but this is actually relevant. What's actually interesting here is they were worried they couldn't keep their doctors. This is what sunk Hillary Care. Because Hillary said, yeah, you're going to lose your doctors. Yeah, you're going to lose your health care plan. They were at least honest about it. Okay. <laughs> Lessons learned, okay? <laughs> but this failed, and it wasn't until President uh, Barack Obama was inaugurated that they uh, had new efforts to try to reform health care. Um, one constitutional fact, Ilya, what does Barack Obama have in common with FDR? Back to this picture, let's see if you get this. Uh, he had to redo the presidential oath, right? Not redo, what record did he share with FDR? Record. Mm. I'm sure I'll think of it eventually, but uh, <laughs> okay. I'll so let you win this part of the exchange. Uh, <laughs> so FDR and Obama share a record as the only presidents to say the oath of office four times. I was almost right. You were close, <laughs> right? So you might recall at inauguration 2008, he and the Chief Justice flubbed the oath. So they had to do a do-over in the White House later. Okay. Fast forward to 2012. The Constitution says the president's term begins on January 20th. Okay. Uh, January 20th, 2013 was a Sunday. And they couldn't have the inauguration this Sunday because you know Sarah Palin wouldn't like that. So they had a you know a fake inauguration in the White House, uh, and they had a real inauguration outside. So Obama's taking the oath of office four times. Uh, uh, the take care clause maybe he didn't take, pay much attention to, but I guess he took that oath several times. So anyway, he deals with health care, and his baby, his law is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. Uh, no one even talks about patient protection anymore. Everyone just calls it the Affordable Care Act or commonly known as Obamacare. One note which, which should be stressed uh, is particularly relevant. Anyone saw Bill Clinton the other day criticizing uh, the president for not keeping his promise? Uh, that's some chutzpah because one, well, his plan will take away everyone's health care. Okay? Two, Obama copied Hillary's plan. 
I can't say it more clearly. Obama took Hillary's plan and made it his own. Okay? So whatever crap is coming from Obamacare, that was Hillary's plan, just she didn't win, couldn't implement it. So there's some double cuts for there. Anyway, so we got the Constitution. Obamacare was very unpopular, and not just on policy grounds, it's also unpopular on constitutional grounds. Specifically from a group called the Tea Party, which you might remember, they're not heard from too much anymore, but this group kind of sprung up uh, and rallied around a constitutional argument against Obamacare. Um, they actually protested and marched on Washington saying that Obamacare violates the Constitution. I found it remarkable. I went to one of these rallies in Washington uh, uh, in March 2010 when the law was being uh, debated in the House, and you actually had signs saying overturn Wicker v. Filter, you know, and enforce enumerated powers. And, you know, these are, I can say this to George Mason, people won't get mad at me, right? So these are not the most sophisticated people, but they had a very strong passion for the Constitution, and they, and they said, this is not constitutional. And you had these massive rallies. I mean, lots of people uh, are coming to Washington, okay? One other fact. At the time, you might recall, in 2009, the Democrats had a supermajority. They had 60 seats in the Senate for a very brief period. In that interlude between when Al Franken was confirmed and when Scott Brown was elected, that brief period, they had a 60 seat block. Okay? Republicans had absolutely no interest in passing this law. So the Democrats said, you know what? We have 60 seats. We can break a filibuster. Let's go for it. And that's exactly what Harry Reid did. He wanted to push through this piece of legislation. By the way, does anyone know how many pages the Affordable Care Act is? So you can take guesses. 2000. 2000. Oh, okay. 20, 2,700, give or take, depending on the pagination. So it's almost 3,000 pages. The final version of the law was only introduced roughly, I don't know, a couple weeks before it was actually voted on in, in the Senate. Um, I mean, Assuming you read like Richard Epstein, you still could have read the entire thing in a period of time, okay? It's like, if you imagine like three copies of Atlas Shrugged, stat, that, that's affecting the book, okay? Uh, it's even more painful to read. So, no one actually read it, but they had a vote on it on Christmas Eve 2009. And the House hadn't voted on a law on Christmas Eve in over 100 years. But they had to do this because they had to vote on it before they went back to their uh, districts. But what's interesting is the version the Senate voted on on Christmas Eve was not meant to be the final version. It's an important point. It was a draft. This was something just meant to send over to the House, the House do some voting, send it back to the Senate, back and forth, right? They weren't anticipating ever having the filibuster problems. They had the 60 vote block. But then this happened, right? Senator Ted Kennedy passed away that summer. And who replaced him? Scott Brown. And I want to put this in perspective. A Republican won the Senate seat in Massachusetts of Ted Kennedy on the platform of stopping health care reform. A Republican took Ted Kennedy's seat in Massachusetts to stop health care reform for crying out loud. This was remarkable. This is a testament to how unpopular this law was. Um, it's simply stunning that this happened. But Scott Brown won. He campaigned as a 41st vote. And he wasn't for 41st vote. So now we had a problem. That original draft version of the bill that passed the Senate could not go back to the Senate. The second it, the Senate went back to the Senate, it would be filibustered, killed. All right. So the easy way, you know, how a bill becomes a law, Senate has a version, the House has a version, agree, send it to the President for signature. But the House wasn't happy with the Senate version. There was lots of crap they didn't want. There was just people the court was for kickback, Louisiana Purchase, all this other graft, okay? So Speaker Pelosi <laughs> decided that she knew how she was gonna do this. Banner wasn't happy about it. So we have this, this huge law. Uh, don't forget the Snooky tax and excise tanning. So what Pelosi effectively said is that we have to use a reconciliation process. And I won't bore you too much, but usually when you have budgets, right, and you have one version of the Senate, and you have one version of the House, there's a process where you can reconcile differences to try and iron out kinks, if you will. And that process is not subject to the filibuster. And this is usually used for rather mundane things, not, you know, rewriting the entire chunks of the law. So what Pelosi did was she used this reconciliation process to rewrite significant portions of the law. Okay? knowing that this would not be subject to a filibuster. For what it's worth, a lot of the bugs that we're seeing now, not on the website, but elsewhere, are the result of this expeditious process, the result of passing a law that wasn't really reconciled. There are a lot of iron out kinks. Uh, to, to use one example, this litigation, which uh, Professor Summon might mention, uh, uh, the way the exchange laws were written, if the federal government's operating exchange, people in the states can't get subsidies. This was a direct drafting error that probably wouldn't figure it out, but couldn't because Pelosi had to pass it then. Anyway, so it brought up for a vote, and it passed. And what's remarkable about these numbers, you had 34 Democrats across the aisle to vote against the law. Huge goose egg right there. 
Not a single Republican backed it. Which I think is a salient metric when you're talking about the laws, uh, 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 legitimacy of the eyes of the American people, not just constitutionality. But when you have a law that's opposed by such a large percentage of the population and 49% of Congress, it says something. I went back and did all the math. This was the only major piece of legislation passed on party line voting. So the Security Act, Medicaid Act, Civil Rights Act, you name it, they all had at least two thirds. Joe Biden, of all people, Biden told, he was in a debate in 2007, he said, if we want health care, we need two thirds of votes. Biden said this. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan told Hillary Clinton, if you want health care, we need 70 votes. Any seasoned politician knew this. But we have open change right there, okay? So anyway, it goes to the president, right? The president signs it. What's kind of cool is seeing all these pens. There are 23 commemorative pens which were used uh, 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 to sign off on all the various uh, parts of his signature, and he handed each pen off as a, as a souvenir. And when the president signed it, um, he said something to the effect of, the battle over Obamacare is over. <laughs> this, was, this was March 23rd, uh, 2010. The battle over Obamacare is over. Where are we? November 13th, 2013, and I don't even know anymore. I have to confess error, okay? When I sent this book to press, I thought Obamacare was basically a done deal, right? So much just keeps happening. I have to write a sequel. I'm going to have to. Uh, 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 I should also commend uh, Professor Soman and his vile conspirators have a new book out in the Obamacare case called The Conspiracy Against Obamacare. Check that out also, okay? But back to my book. <laughs> I'm sure he'll mention it later. So, what was the immediate problem? <laughs> what was the immediate problem? Illy and I are good friends, we're just, we're just ripping. Uh, even if our baseball interests are, are separate. Uh, even, even as a law was being passed, there were serious constitutional doubts, right? Was this law constitutional? And for those of you who have taken con law, maybe yes, maybe no, I'll give you a brief recitation. So, let's see. This is really good. Who can figure out what case I'm looking at from this picture? I feel like I'm on BuzzFeed or something. Yes? With your key filter? Good, yeah. So, here we have. Roscoe Filburn, Farmer Filburn. And this is Secretary of the Agriculture of Claude Wickard, all these little graphs and charts and five-year plans behind him. Uh, it, it's very, very Roosevelt. So this case involved the Commerce Clause, right? The farmer said, I want to grow wheat on my farm that only I will consume, only animals will consume, right? FDR and Secretary said, no, you can't do that. We're going to limit the amount of wheat you can create. And he goes, wait a minute. This is wheat just for me and my animals. It never crosses the farm, never crosses state line, right? How can you tell me what this is? This is not interstate commerce. And what did the Supreme Court say? They said that your growing of wheat on your own land affects interstate commerce because if you don't grow it, then you have to buy it from someone else. Yes, right? This is what's been called substantial effects tests or other ways, right? Your decision to grow your own wheat, even though your wheat never crosses state lines, will have an effect on some other state and some of the interstate market. So we have the Commerce Clause, right? And this gives Congress a very broad expanse of power to regulate interstate commerce. Now, this one's suffering. Who knows what this case is, Billy, don't you? Okay, I'll give you another name. Don't, don't say it. Oh, Shiva. Not Shiva. Oh. Medical marijuana case. Good, oh, yeah. Uh, Angel Rage, right. This is Angel Rage. Okay, so she had an advance, well, was it cancer, I think? It was some advanced form of cancer. Um, and the only thing that could help her was uh, medicinal marijuana. And who knows what this thing is, right? Say vape product? Vape, yeah. Uh, I love when I give it to Texas, no one ever wants to say it. Uh, but when I was in NYU, one of those guys like, vape. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a vaporizer which uses to ingest medicinal marijuana. And that's her only relief. So she consumed marijuana that was grown on a local farm in California and never crossed state lines, okay? So this case is actually represented by Randy Barnett, who authored the forward of my book and also co authored the follow book with, with Ilya. Okay? Randy represented her. In this case, argues, saying, listen, this is different than Wickard, right? There's no market for drugs. You know, how can my decision to grow my pot affect the interstate marijuana market, right? Is there an interstate marijuana market? <laughs> yeah, there is, uh, apparently. <laughs> so this is actually a picture of Rach on the phone where she lost her case. Uh, Supreme Court ruled against her, I think it was 6 3. Uh, the court said that the decision for her to use marijuana affects the interstate marijuana market, and there was an opinion by Justice Scalia, about the necessary proper law, maybe he'll mention later, but she lost, okay? These are two big precedents that lead us to not weed, not weed, but broccoli. Can the government make you buy broccoli, okay? This was the searing image of the law. And it was actually a very genius stroke by Barnett and others who kind of came up with this idea in very bad early uh, volume. Okay? If the, the question is, can Congress regulate one-sixth of the economy? Okay? 
Healthcare is a multi-billion dollar industry. Is that commerce? Well, yeah, of course it is. And Congress uh, designate various rules of how policies are issued, or perhaps rules of uh, uh, how insurance companies operate? Sure. But this presents a slightly different question. Okay? The way Obamacare works, I'm sure you will know, is it has a mandate that says you shall, that's where in the statute, you shall maintain insurance. Okay? Is this regulating economic activity? Or is it doing something different? Is this saying you have to do something? Is it regulating economic inactivity? So it's fascinating if you go back and read Rage. The phrase used over and over again is economic activity, economic activity. You can say it to your, your, your nauseous, right? This was different. This is regulating economic inactivity, the argument went. It's compelling someone to engage in commerce. And as Randy Barnett was fond of saying, this was unprecedented that never before had Congress compelled people to purchase a commercial product. Okay? This is the base of the argument, and you can agree with it or disagree with it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you buy a GM vehicle, yeah, right? So these are the basic constitutional principles undergirding this, okay? When you go back to the signature, you can actually see his O is very jagged, and that was because he used all the different pens to, uh, mm -hmm. to write his signature, okay? So within minutes of the lawsuit being filed, seven to be exact, I'm sorry, within minutes of the president's signature drawing, lawsuits were filed, and the, uh, well, I got paid this line, I guess, the first lawsuit was filed by this guy, who was an alum of the law school. Uh, it's kind of funny. In, in 2000, uh, I guess it would have been 2008, I organized a debate in this very room uh, when Ken Cuccinelli was uh, running for the Republican primary. And he went up against this other guy who was the Fairfax County School Board Director. And uh, this other guy was talking about like taxes, and Ken was talking about the Ninth Amendment. And uh, eh, whatever, he lost. But he won this case. Cuccinelli filed suit in Virginia. And he actually got a judge to rule in his favor. A judge actually ruled that the individual mandate is unconstitutional, that Congress can't compel, uh, cannot compel you to engage in commercial activity. And the president was not happy about this. Okay? And, and during this time, you actually had a rising unpopularity. The law has remained unpopular. And even now, it's even more unpopular than it was before. Um, it, it's striking how even four years later, the law has just sustained the, the, this aversion. The main lawsuit, though, was not the Virginia lawsuit. It was actually in Florida. Uh, this was brought by. Uh, 26 attorneys general uh, from Florida, Texas, I mean, all the states John McCain won, basically. These states <laughs> brought a massive challenge uh, on behalf of their citizens, which is also noteworthy from a federal perspective, that the states are actually guarding the liberty of their people. Judge Vincent ruled in their favor. And not only that, he found the entire Affordable Care Act was unconstitutional, not just a mandate, but the entire, the whole shebang, the entire enchilada, okay? Obama was not happy with this, as you might imagine, because now you have a legitimate constitutional argument. This is not some sort of fringe law professor blog post anymore. You actually have now an Article III judge saying Congress cannot do this. This is a big, to quote Joe Biden, a big effing deal. By the way, do you know, do you know where the big effing deal line comes from? You know, Obamacare. <laughs> when, when, when Obama, at, at the signing ceremony for the Affordable Care Act, Joe Biden was putting a hot mic saying this is a big effing deal. So that's actually where that came from. So off to the courts of appeals we go. We have a, a, a Former acting Solicitor General Neil Katyal and uh, Superman lawyer Paul Clement argue in this case. That several uh, uh, cases, the first uh, uh, court to rule is actually the Sixth Circuit in Ohio, uh, and famously Judge Jeff Sutton, a prominent conservative, ruled in favor of the administration. He upheld the law, which was somewhat striking. His opinion was uh, whatever, but he found a way to uphold the law. Okay, Obama was happy. It's my happy Obama picture. He, he's very happy. <laughs> <laughs> kind of smug. So then we have the 11th Circuit. This was really the big event because this was the case of the 26th Attorneys General. Uh, and in a, a, a really significant opinion, you had a joint opinion by this is Judge Frank Hall uh, and Judge uh, du Joel Dubino. And they issued this opinion saying that the mandate's unconstitutional. This was really significant. Why? We have a circuit split. This might seem like you know common sense, but there was no guarantee the Supreme Court would ever take this case. A lot of people doubted the Supreme Court. They might want to stay out of it. And if every court of appeals upheld the law, you know, they could they could just deny certiorari. We got a split now. At this point, it was actually my I think it was on my the day before my birthday, so it was August 12th, uh, uh, 2010, uh, uh, or I guess 2011. We had this decision, which was um, a really big deal. Um, and the law even sustained its, its unpopularity. To this day, uh, people are still opposing it, okay? And 
and Obama thought we had to stop this, right? <laughs> All right sure. Now look, we have to stop this. Now we have the Fourth Circuit opinion. Um, this one didn't really make too much of a dent. This was actually the Cuccinelli case, um, and they tossed Ken, Ken out due to lack of standing. Uh, I won't bore you with the details, but Virginia essentially tried to bring suit on behalf of itself as a sovereign, not on behalf of individuals, and the court said that states can't do that because that's effectively nullification. Um, and they said they discussed nullification. You, you talk about that later, but this was not the most significant case. Uh, Obama happy. Then we go to the DC Circuit, we have a change of characters. This is actually the Solicitor General, Don Verrilli. He came on board right before the DC Circuit argument. Uh, um, and what was interesting about the DC Circuit was a point made by Judge Kavanaugh. Um, Judge Kavanaugh is a very prominent Bush appointee served in the Bush White House. And Kavanaugh had one sentence as an opinion that said, listen, if this law was written slightly differently, right? If this law didn't have the word shall in there, and it said this is a tax, the law will be clearly constitutional. There'll be no doubt about its constitutionality. You all pay Social Security tax, right? You're assessed a tax on your paycheck, goes to Social Security, and then you can claim that entitlement later in life, right? If Obamacare had been written as a tax, this entire constitutional debate would have been really easy because it'd be effectively Social Security or Medicaid for all. But it wasn't written like that. Congress took deliberate effort not to call it a tax. In fact, the president went on TV and said over and over and over and over and over and over again, this is not a tax, this is not a tax. If you like your church, you can keep it. He's sensing a pattern. There were lots of promises made that no intent to be kept. Well, that's a question later. So the president said this wasn't a tax. When Congress wrote it, they said it wasn't a tax. They were very clear about that. They have other things that's collected by the IRS and you pay with your tax return or whatever, but they called it a penalty. The enforcement mechanism for the mandate was a penalty. If you don't have insurance, you pay the penalty. That's what it's called. But Kavanaugh said, wait a minute. We just changed one word in the statute, three words actually, penalty tax. This is easy, okay? Now you might say, what kind of ridiculousness is this? Congress passed a statute. Judges have to interpret the statute as written. But this line had an impact on the Solicitor General. He said, wait a minute. This tax argument hasn't been getting much weight before. But this is on something, but a conservative judge like Kavanaugh thinks it might be a good idea to rewrite the statute, maybe we should. Okay, anyway, happy Obama, one of the DC Circuit. Off to one first street we go. Oh, the nine, they're so happy here, smiling, cheering. Uh, I thought they looked so beautiful. But, you know, the court and the president always, haven't always had the best relationships, um, particularly just Alito. So who knows what this picture is? <laughs> you know this one? <laughs> And I actually had an animated GIF in there, too. That's, that's, <laughs> that's not actually his hand. So you might recall the 2010 State of the Union after the Citizens United case was decided, uh, the president got up there at like 20 feet from the, from the justices, and he said that the uh, Citizens United case was this horrible thing. He reversed 100 years of precedent. It opened the floodgates for foreign spending, yada, 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 right? Alito, who, who was on he was on camera. He should have perhaps known that, but I guess he has an ill temper. Uh, uh, actually <laughs> shook his head and said, not true. Uh, not the best idea. But I think this is symbolic because we know the president was be not afraid to criticize the court if they think he doesn't like him. Uh, the Chief Justice has been very careful in saying he doesn't want the court to be involved with politics. Anyway, so go to the court. Now, have, you, have any of you been to the Supreme Court before arguments? Good. Okay, when you do this outside of Virginia, no one ever goes. Has anyone ever waited outside for tickets? Yep. Which, which case? Um, it was a really small one. I don't know the name. It was just a professor from the University of Richmond that I met. So okay. I don't remember the case. I waited for bond arguments. That was a good case. Yeah, it was. So I've done this several times and it sucks. How long did you have to wait for bond? Uh, which of the two bond cases? Three. So long. Three, so, yeah. three hours. Three hours. Okay, so I waited for McDonald's in Chicago. This was a gun oh, case. I waited about. Wow. 14 hours, oh, uh, and it was pretty long, right? So for the Obamacare case, as you know, there's no way to get tickets. The number one person line waited 96 hours on the street in March, in Washington, in the rain and cold. See all the tarps? It was raining, it was very cold. Um, uh, Il Ilya, did you go in? No, I don't remember. No, yeah, so the other Ilya had someone wait for him, but this Ilya <laughs> didn't. Anyone know about the two Ilyas? Okay. Ilya Shapiro and Ilya Soman. We're very grateful for Ilya Shapiro to be here to talk with us today. Anyway. Oh, <laughs> uh, God. Anyway, so the scene outside the court was, was, uh, was a zoo. And as we know, there are no cameras in the court. Um, so the only way is to get the audio online. 
uh, which was released later that day. So uh, I listened to it on C-SPAN like, like many people. And the arguments were a stage over the course of three days. Um, the first day was a day that people weren't really paying attention to. The first day involved something very obscure called the task anti-injunction act, which I won't even bore you with. But one of the most important aspects of the first day is the Solicitor General made a point of making the point that Kavanaugh made, they're saying, listen, the most reasonable way of reading the statute is as a tax. Even if it's not a tax, even if Congress didn't call it that, in function and purposes that it operates. And the Chief Justice seemed very actually receptive to this argument, which is something that most people weren't really paying much attention to because all the focus was on day two. Um, day two was the big Commerce Clause issue. Uh, can Congress compel people to purchase health insurance through the Commerce Clause? And that was something of a really big issue. Uh, but really, the Solicitor General's main opponent on day two uh, was some good old H2O. Uh, I almost got it. <laughs> I used to do a Marco Rubio joke, but it's gotten stale, so I stopped. So, when the SG has a case before the court, the practice is to do two moots, like two practice rounds, which is, you know, each lasts several hours. Okay? He had three arguments in one week. So he did six moots the week before. His voice was shot. So right before he goes to the podium, you know, glass of water, a sip of water, right? Went down the wrong pipe. He gets up there, says, Mr. Chief Justice, may I please the court? He goes through maybe 20 or 30 seconds of his shtick, and he freezes. And you can hear on the courtroom audio about seven or eight seconds of absolute silence, total silence. He's gagging. He can't breathe. You can actually hear him reaching for the pitcher of water. You hear the ice cubes clinking around. Pours himself a cup of water, takes a sip, and he resumes. Uh, this is not an auspicious start. But remarkably, <coughs> he had his opening committed to memory, so he actually started from Baden where he left off and continued. Um, really got a bum rap, but he's a, big, he's a pretty good lawyer, and he, he, wins, he wins cases, uh, which I think has been commended. He had a strategy that, that, that turned out okay. But on the Commerce Clause, his strategy did not work. Um, I haven't talked much about the limiting principle, but there's this notion that if Congress can make me buy insurance, they make me buy broccoli. That was his issue. What is your limiting principle? Um, and below, uh, Neil Katyal would offer a limiting principle, say, well, as long as a law affects a sort of national problem, healthcare is a national problem, you know, not, no one single state can fix the healthcare issue, right? As long as there's a national problem like healthcare, Congress can do it. The SG resisted this argument to a large extent. There was a fear in the office that by giving a principle that was too broad, or the word used too capacious, they'd be laying the government off, I mean, they'd be giving the justice reasons to rule against them. They didn't want to give too broad a principle. So instead, he didn't really give a principle at all. He gave this kind of meandering statement that wasn't very good. Um, this strategy didn't work. Uh, no one bought it, uh, um, and, it, and the Commerce Clause issue, he would eventually lose. But really, this is an argument on day one about the tax that proved to be decisive. Uh, Paul Clement got up there and had the second coming. He was awesome. Uh, he absolutely killed it, which is not too hard to do when you have justice in your favor. But uh, he, he's, a, he's a wonderful advocate. And, and I love these pictures. They all look so close together. They're not quite that close, but uh, uh, this is pretty squudged together. So what happened afterwards, on, on day three, the arguments about the severability. So if the mandate is unconstitutional, what about the rest of the law? And this is actually a big <coughs> issue, because had the court just struck down the mandate but left the rest of the Federal Care Act intact, the thing would have fallen apart. It would have been an absolute adverse selection death spiral nightmare. In fact, to bring a little contemporary, efforts to delay the mandate we're talking about now, that would mess things up so badly because all the insurance premiums have been set with the assumption that everyone will be in it. If people can be exempt for a year, insurance prices will just drop out of the market for the next year. It's, I'll, I'll take questions later. It's, it will just be an absolute freaking nightmare. But that was the issue of severability. Okay? Uh, of course, Nino, Nino did the broccoli joke in, he always does. Uh, he, he asked about the broccoli question. Okay. And the final day was something of a, a off issue, was the Medicaid expansion, which I haven't mentioned yet. But one of the ways the Affordable Care Act makes a healthcare more available is by offering Medicaid to people who are at 133% of the poverty line. So basically a lot more people get Medicaid. The problem is the states have been responsible for administering Medicaid. It's kind of dual uh, federal-state partnership, if you will. Okay? The Fed said, okay, states will pay 100% the next whatever years, then after they'll pay 90%. But states object, saying this is a violation of our state sovereignty. You're making us engage in this program that we don't want to engage in. Okay? 
This argument wasn't really considered much of a winner. Not a single court had bought it alone. It's interesting what happened. So after the case was argued, this guy was in Baltimore or something. Uh, he, was, he was looked to be, uh, I'm kidding, he's not Baltimore, Justice Kennedy. He, he, was, he was looked upon as the key decisive swing vote, as he often is. But in fact, it was this guy, this, this doughy eyed, stargazing, oh, isn't he adorable? John G. Roberts, right? Oh, the man. He would be deciding the fate of this law. And, and it's interesting to think about the kind of juxtaposition between <laughs> Obama and Roberts. They both reached the pinnacles of their respective professions. Uh, they both went to Harvard Law School. They're both very well respected people. Um, and really, John Roberts would have to define the signature legislation of the Obama administration. And how did he do it? He did exactly what Brett Kavanaugh said he should do. He did exactly what Don Verrilli said he should do. And, and, and in fairness, this was not a very big part of the arguments, but it was in the briefs, and it was, it was discussed extensively during arguments. And I can tell you from interviews with the SG, this was a key part of their strategy. I mean, the, the Solicitor General's office knew that this was going to be an issue. So how did it happen? Well, Obama, when he, when he was selling the law, said, this is not a tax. If you like your church, you can keep it, right? He made a promise, whatever, he didn't even keep it. Second one, John Roberts said, the law that Congress passed is not a tax. But to save its constitutionality, I will construe it as a tax. What John Roberts did was effectively rewrite the law. He rewrote it. There's no other way of looking at it. He rewrote the law. He upheld a law that Congress never passed. Okay? You might want to say it's an act of a judicial restraint, but I think it's an act of uh, uh, activism to the greatest extent. He took a law that would have never pass. Congress would have never pass his tax increase. Remember the president's pledge, I will not raise taxes? Yeah, whatever, another promise. He said it was a tax. He also said the law is not constitutional to the Commerce Clause. So we have this weird ruling where it's not a, it's not a constitutional tax, it's not constitutional to the Commerce Clause, but if we take this fictional unicorn version of the law, this fairy tale non-whatever tax, we can uphold it. That's how Obamacare was saved, by imposing a tax. Okay? There was a dissent, there was actually a joint dissent by a, a Scalia, Kennedy, uh, excuse me, Thomas and Alito. They will struck down the entire law, all of it, all 3,000 pages. Okay. Uh, Justice Thomas, I like to say, would have written a dissent that would have uh, reversed the 20th century. Uh, <laughs> brought us back to the good old days of, uh, of uh, Darby, I guess. Billy's fist pumping. Yeah. <laughs> Bring back Jones and Law. You hear of Jones Laughlin. You hear of Darby. You know, let's go back to the, let's go back to the Taft Court, right? I, I like the Taft Court. Yeah. Much better than much better than Holmes. I'm not a Holmes fan. I actually a student yelled at me for making fun of Holmes during November. And I, 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 I don't buy him. He had a mustache. I'm not a Holmes fan. <laughs> three generations of imbecilic students is enough. But <laughs> yeah, well, three, three Holmes opinions would have been enough. We got a lot more than unfortunately. <laughs> oh, I found the dissent from Buchanan vs. Worley. I'm going to write about it later. Anyway, yeah. Does anyone else know that Justice Holmes wrote a dissent from Buchanan vs. Worley? It was never published. We'll talk about that later. Interestingly enough, Justice Breyer and Kagan uh, uh, voted with the majority on a narrow issue about the Medicaid expansion. What the majority said was, if a state doesn't want to participate in the Medicaid expansion, they don't have to. Uh, that's why Virginia, this fine commonwealth, has not participated in it. Although, with your new governor, uh, I'm sorry, you know, you might have to. I don't know. Justice Ginsburg and Sotomayor said, the entire thing is good law. It's totally constitutional. Oh, I just realized I covered up your poster. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a really cool poster behind this. I'm sorry. I covered it up. Anyway, Ginsburg and Sotomayor said the entire law is constitutional. But at the end, Ginsburg said, this will be barely a blip. Okay. Law is upheld. Now here comes the funny part. There are no cameras in the court, right? So how does the media supposed to know what happens? Well, the second the Supreme Court opened court that day, the website went down. I guess we're just a preview of other websites, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so they're basically reduced left to paper copy. So the second the Chief Justice says, we now have the case in whatever National Federation of Business for Sedilius, the uh, Public Information Office has a paper copies of the opinion, right? And you actually have these interns in suits and sneakers taking the opinions and running to the street. It's, it's freaking hilarious. There's, there's, a, there's a gift of it on BuzzFeed. You, you can check it out. So the opinion was over 200 pages long, right? So you had these reporters on the street trying to parse it like in three seconds. So <laughs> CNN, right? So uh, 
So what happens on CNN is the, their, their court reporter, his name was Kate Baldwin, which was on the street. And you can see her reading from page three of the, of the syllabus. And on page three it says, um, I checked the video, you can see what she's reading. On uh, page three it says, the Chief Justice found this law violates the Commerce Clause. So based on that fact, she goes and tells Wolf Blitzer, uh, Obamacare is unconstitutional, the law is unconstitutional. And CNN blasts it out to the world, right? You know, the millions of people. This wouldn't be so funny if you guess who else is watching CNN. <laughs> yeah, the president was watching CNN. So for a good seven minutes, he thought his law was unconstitutional. <laughs> uh, had, had Kate Baldwin turned to page four of the opinion, where it said, but the Chief Justice finds this constitutional attack, she would have known, but they didn't get that far. You got to read, right? So in fairness, Fox made the same mistake, and actually Megyn Kelly was reading SCOTUS blog on her iPad um, as it was going down, which is kind of funny. But eventually, super happy Obama, right? He found out his law was upheld. Uh, his White House counsel came in, Kathy Rubler, gave her two thumbs up. He's like, what do you mean? I thought I lost. No, 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 you won, you won. And that's how it went down. Uh, we have given the Dewey's Beats Truman moment for the 21st century. Uh, <laughs> when people don't laugh at that joke, and I'm in the wrong room. Uh, I, think, I think the Solicitor General is walking vindicated with a lot of his choices. Uh, I think John Roberts shredded significant parts of the, uh, of the law. Uh, 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 if you recall, Glenn Beck called him a coward. Uh, what's this guy saying? Willard something. Right, Mitt Romney did. <laughs> he ran on the platform of repealing replacing Obamacare. Of course, what makes it so infuriating is he created it. Uh, during the debate with President Obama, Obama said, Romney Care is the godfather of Obamacare. This was the worst possible candidate to run on this issue. I, I, I can't even imagine, right? So I thought, I gotta take this slide out. I thought this was, I thought, I thought this was true, that the Obamacare repeal effort ended with the presidential election. Apparently not. So this is actually the president's third inauguration, uh, uh, where the chief justice was shaking his hands. I would love to hear what they're muttering around. I was like, you son, thank you. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and we have healthcare, we have the constitution. And I think we have this contrasting uh, sense between the president and John Roberts. So this is where my presentation ended, right? Yeah, until uh, Green Eggs and Ham. <laughs> oh, my junior senator. Right, remember this? This is like so long ago, right? Remember this? Yeah. Shut down. We had a government to shut down over Obamacare. This effort is not over. Remember this? The, the barricades, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, Adrian, that's your name. Everyone see that? She actually came out to, no, not the master. She made herself public today, saying that she's been cyber bullied because she's become the face of Obamacare. Want something funnier? <laughs> She hasn't signed up for it, and she has no interest in the law. <laughs> Even funnier, she wasn't paid for this. She wanted free professional shots of herself and her family, and HHS use it and sign up for the rights. She's also not a citizen either. Uh, I think she, she, she's, she's a foreign national. <laughs> she is eligible under the law, but she's not even there. <laughs> you can't make this up. I, I really, I wish I could make this up, but I can't. Uh, but as we know, this website has not been doing too well. <laughs> this, this is really funny. <laughs> yeah. It hasn't worked so good. But the, uh, I think the real face uh, of this is, is, are these, which are going out to people across the country. These are, are cancellation notices, right? This is the entire, if you like your plan, you can keep it. Well, no, of course that wasn't going to be true. The entire nature of Obamacare is it changes how people have health care. So it's not meant to maintain the status quo. Uh, I think it was a lie. I don't know the way to say it. And this was from last week where Kathleen Sibelius was getting uh, crucified uh, because uh, of both the website and, and the outcomes of this case. So I don't even know how to, how to, how to conclude this because we're not done with this, right? Um, just today I was reading the Washington Post that they're not going to make their December 1st deadline. It's not going to be fixed by the deadline. Um, and if people aren't able to sign up by the end of the year, people are going to have to start being assessed the health care tax or as a penalty. And I've actually argued and opted out with Randy Barnett that any efforts to delay this penalty must acknowledge it's in fact a tax. If they call it a penalty, it's unconstitutional. It has to be a tax. So Congress and the President have to finally admit if there's a delay that this wasn't that the tax. Okay? But the Constitution is pretty cool like that, right? Mm -hmm. That we have this massive law that's had such unpopularity that sustained this conflict over so many years. And it's given a chance to write a book and probably another book. Anyway, I won't talk, pick up any more of your time. Uh, I welcome my, my, my good friend, Elias Soman, to come up and tell me uh, why I'm entirely wrong. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I appreciate it. I'll take all of your questions after, after Professor Soman has his time. Thank you so much.
you. Can we have this room until we even a little after six, right? right? Okay, so if anyone wants to leave for the last, don't let me keep you. Yeah. So I only have about five minutes of remarks. Uh, and I, I waive my rebuttal, so you, you can take, take as much time as you want. No, I'll still limit it to five minutes uh, because you may change your mind about whether you want to waive a rebuttal after <laughs> you hear what I have to say. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, and I say this to the author of another book about the Obamacare case, if you're only going to read one book among those that have already come out about it, and I've read them all, so I know what I speak, this is probably the book that you should read because I think we are still too close to this event uh, to have real historical perspective on it. Indeed, it's still ongoing as we speak, right? There is efforts to uh, repeal or change various parts of Obamacare. They're gathering steam in the House and in the Senate, even some by Democrats even then. Are going on right now so we don't yet have proper historical perspective on this case uh, but this book does a better job of telling the story of what happened and why it happened probably than any other book I've seen so far even though there's already like six or seven of them that have come out including two to which I have been a contributor including a conspiracy against Obamacare which actually just came out yesterday and is now available on Yes, I want to it's out of stock. Uh, it's, it's, it is now actually in stock on Amazon. I just checked a few minutes ago. Uh, and so I uh, get it while it's, while it's still hot off the presses, so to speak. But that's not what I came to talk to you about. I actually wanted to talk about Josh and his book, which is the focus today. And it's a real honor, actually, to be able to uh, comment on Josh's work here, because not only is this perhaps the best book about the Obamacare case currently around, uh, but Josh is actually one of the best young legal scholars anywhere in the legal academy. If you look up at his, if it is CV, he already has more and better stuff in there uh, than most people do when they come up for tenure. Like, I've seen tenure files occasionally. It's my job to pass judgment on them. Some people here, some people at other schools, where I serve as an outside reviewer, and he's only been a law professor for, it's a, it's a year and a half now, is that not even a year and a half, but he already has more and better stuff in there than uh, most of those files that I've seen have. Plus, he's a leading blogger and also one of the most distinguished graduates ever of George Mason Law School. So he's really <laughs> taking over the world of legal academia. And, uh, as my wife says, in a few years we'll probably be all be working for Josh. He, he, he already no has He won't give you any health care benefits, but at least he won't make you eat broccoli either if you, if you work for him. Uh, so. Uh, indeed, my only real criticism of Josh uh, is that uh, he's a New York Yankees <laughs> fan. This is a flaw in his education that we, the faculty of George Mason Law School, are responsible for. However, uh, uh, I, I do still have hope here for change we can believe in in this area, <laughs> and that earlier this year the Yankees admitted that they are the evil empire of baseball, uh, and Josh, I think, over time will realize that he cannot be supporting an institution that not only is evil, but even openly admits and rebels uh, in its evil. And if that doesn't make him change his mind, maybe the fact that the Red Sox just won the World Series uh, will help. <laughs> so I'm going to very briefly mention what I think are some of the strengths of this book, and I'm going to mention a couple points where I do believe Josh either went wrong or at least didn't go as far uh, in discussing the issue as he should have. Uh, I think what I like about this book is it really describes in great detail how the legal strategy on both sides developed, both by the challengers and by the federal government defending the law. Uh, it's really sort of a great blow-by-blow -blow account of it, what occurred, not just on the legal side, but here is also the second strength of the book. Josh integrates the legal story very well with the political story, some of which he told you just now. Uh, there's no way I can do full justice to this in the few minutes that I have, but I think one of the things that you learn in studying constitutional law is that the legal world has some autonomy from politics. I don't think uh, court decisions are purely political, but politics particularly in such an unprecedented and important case as this one uh, does have an influence. Josh gives a really good discussion of how and why uh, that occurred. Uh, so this book also has many virtues in the way that it discusses some of the particular episodes that occurred. I can't touch on that in detail right now, but I'm sure some of it will come up during the questions. Uh, I do, however, have uh, three uh, broader reservations of the book, which I'm going to mention, and uh, I have some smaller ones as well, which I won't get into right now, but we can talk about in the questions if you want. My biggest is that Josh, uh, in his book, doesn't really go into the necessary and proper clause aspect of the issue. Uh, he says very little about it. Uh, as Josh mentioned, 
federal government basically made three arguments as to why they thought this was constitutional. One is it's constitutional under the Commerce Clause, which gives Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. Uh, but this argument was always at least a little bit shaky in that everybody admitted that not having health insurance isn't in and of itself commerce. So maybe it can be regulated, uh, nonetheless anyway under the Commerce Clause because of the fact that uh, not having health insurance affects interstate commerce. It has an effect on it. Uh, and the Supreme Court had indeed used this effects test in cases like Wickard and Raich, but all of those cases dealt with something where at least you were actively doing something, actively engaging in what the court called economic activity, so growing marijuana, using marijuana, growing wheat, feeding it to cows, and so forth. Uh, whereas in this case, it doesn't seem like there's any economic activity actually going on, so it wasn't completely clear that you could win under the Commerce Clause. But what the federal government and also many academics, including myself, thought was their strongest argument was, even if you can't win under the Commerce Clause alone, you can win under the Necessary and Proper Clause, which says that Congress has the power to adopt legislation that is necessary and proper to carrying into execution its other powers. So even if this isn't authorized by the Commerce Clause alone, uh, this is something that's necessary and proper uh, to uh, adopt legislation, to en 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 enable it to effectively regulate commerce. In this case, commerce and healthcare, which is a huge industry that affects one that includes one sixth of the economy. Uh, and the Supreme Court, ever since McCulloch versus Maryland, a case I'm sure most of you are familiar with, had defined necessary very broadly. Uh, they've said necessary is anything that's useful or convenient, so you don't have to prove that it's essential to have the individual mandate to regulate interstate commerce. You just have to prove that it might be useful or helpful, and nobody could seriously doubt that under that test it would be. So those of us who were challenging the law, and I was actually involved in this process to some degree, not as much as Randy Burnett and others, but I had some involvement, we asked, well, how are we to get around this, which is probably their strongest argument. We all thought the tax argument was weak, and I think they, the other side actually thought that too. Uh, but we said, if we're gonna lose, there's a good chance we're gonna lose under necessary and proper. And we said, it might be necessary, but it's necessary and proper, not just necessary. And to make a long story short, the Supreme Court actually agreed with us on this. Five justices said, this is not, that this may be necessary, but it isn't proper. Uh, and this may be one of the most important aspects of the Supreme Court's decision because this is by far the most thorough treatment of the word proper uh, that has ever been given in 200 years of litigation on Nestoran proper clause and it has implications for uh, other future cases that I talk about in some of my own work. Uh, on this, Josh, I think, really doesn't cover this issue in the book very much at all, and it deserves more coverage. I hope to see it in the second edition, which I urge you also to buy. You should buy the first edition, but you should encourage Josh to buy the second edition of his uh, proper. Uh, second issue, which I disagree with Josh somewhat on, is that Josh talks about how Solicitor General were really, in his view, did a great job of winning the case, and I think Josh does a good job of pummeling the many people who, after the oral argument, they said, but really, he has no clue what's going on. You know, he's out to lunch, he doesn't get it. Various legal academics said that, including ones who are actually supportive of his side. He said, well, if I were arguing the case and not Barulli, I would have done a better job, right? I would have presented a better limiting principle. And Josh does a good job of showing that Barulli's strategy is actually a lot better than people said it was. But I think he goes to the opposite extreme. In Josh's book, uh, Barulli comes across as this sort of great guru of Supreme Court litigation. He's the Zen master who knew what was going on and foresaw that the tax argument was going to prevail. I think uh, this is overcompensating uh, too much. If he really thought the tax argument was that great, he wouldn't have put it in the last three or four pages of an over 50 page brief. Uh, that's usually, if you're an experienced appellate lawyer, that's where you put your weakest stuff, right? Uh, and that's how the tax argument was treated there. It's also how he treated it in oral argument as well. He didn't bring it up at all until the justices asked him to do so. Uh, and uh, most of the questioning about it was actually very skeptical. In addition, Verrilli, I think, although he did overall do a good job, I think he flubbed some stuff uh, in a big way, and none bigger than his flubbing of proper, where if you read the federal government's brief, they don't even actually make a separate argument uh, to the effect that this is proper. They don't even recognize at all that somebody could argue that something is necessary but not proper, even though lower court decisions striking down the law had reached this conclusion, and it was in the briefs by the other side, so they're essentially ignoring one of the other side's most important arguments, uh, and it came back to bite them. Not sure whether this was a decision that Barulli made on his own or whether he was somehow constrained by others, but it was a mistake and 
Uh, so I think overall, Rui really did a good job winning in the case, but not quite as good as Josh suggested he did. Uh, finally, Josh argues at some length in the book that uh, by upholding the law in this sort of split the baby kind of a way of holding it, but also restructuring it in a way and giving the critics of the law something, uh, Chief Justice Roberts enhanced the reputation of the court, and if he had struck down the law as a whole, uh, that would have been very bad for the reputation of the court, because of course, Barack Obama would have run against it in the 2012 election and made the Supreme Court a political target. It's possible that Josh is right about this. We can't know for sure, both because it's a counterfactual and because this issue is still ongoing, so it's hard to say how this decision will be perceived 10, 20, 30 years from now. But I have some skepticism about uh, Josh's position on this uh, for two reasons. One is, if you look at the polling going into uh, the decision, 60-70% uh, of the public very consistently wanted the individual mandate to be struck down. Even a plurality of Democrats in some of these polls, self-identified Democrats, said they wanted the mandate to be invalidated. The mandate was actually the least popular part of the law. Uh, usually in most polls, maybe 50 or slightly over 50% said that they did oppose the law as a whole. If you ask them, do you oppose the individual mandate, you get numbers like 75 or 80% pretty consistently. So if this law had been struck down, especially if only the mandate were struck down but not the law as a whole, uh, it would not have been very easy for Obama to run in a platform by I'm attacking the court for making a decision that 70% the public wanted to make. To the contrary, uh, I think Obama would have been the loser in that political battle. He might even have chosen not to fight it that much. Uh, for that reason, if he had chosen it, uh, it would not have gone very well for him. Secondly, in the aftermath of the decision, uh, the Supreme Court's reputation in terms of its public approval rating actually went down somewhat rather than went up. Now, Josh would say it would have gone down even more had they gone the other way. That's a possibility, but uh, the available evidence that we have suggests that Roberts could have ruled the other way, and at worst, it would have, from a reputational standpoint, would have done modest damage to court's reputation. At best, it might actually have improved the court's reputation because uh, he would have ended up striking down something that the vast majority of the public wanted him to strike down. None of this is relevant, perhaps, to whether his decision was legally correct or not, but it is relevant to this question and interest legal academics and also political scientists and others of sort of what are the political constraints on the court uh, and uh, also how does the court's uh, decisions affect its reputation. So there's much more that can be said about both the book uh, and the case and the ongoing struggle over it, but for now, uh, I will pipe down and uh, Josh will take your questions unless he wants to revive. I, I waive my rebuttal. I, I actually agree with everything at least I think they're all fair points, so I welcome questions. Okay. Yes, sir? So I had two things. Uh, you were talking about the individual mandate being repealed. Uh, I was wondering, do you think the uh, bills that are currently being considered to allow people to keep their previous plans would have the same effect as repealing the individual mandate and that they would be removed from these pools, the healthy people? So, so I mean, there's a couple plans. There's one by uh, Senator Mary Landrieu. Uh, there's another one by, uh, uh, who is it? Uh, up, uh, yeah, uh, Upton. Upton, Upton from Michigan, yeah. So the problem with these laws is these policies were already canceled, right? It's very difficult to force insurers to randomly reissue policies that are being canceled. Even worse, if these policies are reissued, they will be in direct violation of Obamacare. For example, say you had a policy that, that gave you a low price because you had no pre-existing conditions, right? Say someone had a high price but had pre-existing conditions. This would frustrate the entire law and would mess up the entire pool because it would bring all these sick people to one pool and all the healthy people would be out of there. So it would, it would wreak such havoc on this law. Um, there's really no way out. Uh, the only way out would be John Roberts is deal with everything, but we're, we're a year past that. So I want to distinguish between these two bills a little bit, and that there's some bills, which many, many of them supported by Democrats, which would just restore poli these policies and make them available to those who already had them. But if you and I wanted to sign up for that policy, we didn't have it before, we wouldn't be able to get it. The Upton bill would actually allow these policies to be sold to anybody who wanted it, whether they had it before or not. So. The narrower bill would cause some real problems for Obamacare because of this pool issue that Josh mentioned. The broader bill would cause even more problems because uh, that really would undermine the uh, sort of pre-existing conditions issue, uh, and it would also perhaps lead to a revolt by the insurance industry. Right? They might just exit. Uh, someone might exit, but also someone would would uh, begin to oppose Obamacare politically. Remember, uh, Obama secured the support of the insurance industry for the bill in part by saying 
you guys are going to get all these new customers and your existing customers will have to pay more money because they'll have to buy a plan that includes more stuff, right? Uh, so if they don't have that uh, situation anymore, then uh, the insurance industry would no longer be supportive of this. So it's very early, both of these bills, they could be rewritten at any time. There might be all kinds of exclusions and amendments, but it's actually very hard to maintain the basic structure of Obamacare while at the same time letting people keep their pre-existing plans. This is why what Obama said was probably a lie in that uh, you know, it's sort of econ 101 that if this thing only depends on people buying more expensive and more comprehensive plans than they had before, then if you let them not do that, then the structure might come crashing down. Oh, Anyone else in the back? I have, I have a question. Yeah. And I'm not sure if I can phrase it properly, but I'm going to give it a shot. This penalty is collected by the IRS. Yes. And it's a penalty for behavior that's unrelated to tax paying. Have you come across in your research any other examples of a time when the IRS is responsible for collecting a penalty on behavior when that behavior is not failure to pay taxes or failure to do something related to taxes? Do you taxes? know, Elia? So much depends on what you mean by related to taxes and what you mean by penalty. I'm serious because this is the kind of stuff we were arguing about when we were arguing about the tax art issue. They're, the defenders of the tax argument, they would say, look, there's lots of stuff in the tax code where, in effect, you end up paying higher taxes if you don't do something uh, that the federal government wants you to do. So for instance, uh, if you don't properly weatherize some of your windows or something, you might end up foregoing a tax de deduction that you would otherwise get. And there's, many similar examples. Uh, on the other side is the problem that uh, first that uh, this is a penalty on sort of pure inactivity just for being in the country, which most of these other ones, uh, they're connected to like something. You, you did X, but you did X without also doing Y, right? We had a window, but it wasn't properly weatherized or something. Secondly, obviously, the way this law is written, uh, it looks like a penalty rather than like, you know, just a tax that actually even uses the word penalty in it. Uh, there's many other complications, but the, the answer to your question to some extent depends on what you mean by a penalty and what you consider to be relevantly similar or, or not. And one other relevant note, usually the IRS is a full panoply of tools to collect tax. They can put liens, they can foreclose, they can do various things. With the Obamacare penalty, they can't do any of the things. Effectively, all they can do, and I'm being serious, and Esher Klein's written this, if you have a tax refund, they can withhold from that refund whatever the penalty would be. They can't actually collect the refund from people. So people just decide not to have insurance and don't pay the penalty. The IRS has absolutely no mechanism short of a withholding a refund to actually collect it. So this actually is more arguable than the commentary wet sign it did. Uh, when this first came out, the Congressional Research Service actually had a report suggesting they can do what is known as a silent lien. That is, if you don't pay the penalty, they might be able to eventually put a lien on your other property that you own. Uh, now, whether or not this is legally true under the law, it will be politically very difficult, especially with the current situation politically and with recent IRS scandals and the like for the IRS to say, well, we're going to put this lien on it. But legally speaking, it's actually debatable whether they can do this or not. Other questions? Anyone else? Okay. Another shot. You were one of only two or three people that I think was there at the time in which the uh, constitutional arguments against Obamacare was first starting at the, I believe, National Lawyers Convention. Yeah, today's actually so, the fourth anniversary. We yeah, the fourth anniversary, basically. Can you tell us about what happened in that meeting? Or are that any of you going to the Lawyers Convention this week? Oh, I'll be there. You should. Oh. Ilya will be presenting. Uh, so, at the lawyers' convention, there was a uh, uh, I'll say people. So there was a guy named Todd Gaziano, who at the time was at, at the Heritage Foundation. He was there. Uh, he ran their legal shop at Heritage. Uh, I was at the lawyers' convention. I kind of walked into the main atrium, and Todd's talking to the professors. Among them, Nelson Lund was here. Andrew Burstyn was along with this law school, a year or two before me. And they were talking about this healthcare law. At the time, the healthcare law hadn't even passed the Senate. It was just ideas. And Todd was saying, you know, I think we need to think of laws. Uh, you know, reason why this law is unconstitutional. At the time, there only been a few staffs. So David Rifkin and Lee Casey, they're Washington lawyers, they published a few op-eds uh, arguing, actually they've been arguing for 20 years, that Congress can't mandate, uh, that they can't compel you to you know, buy something. 
But Todd had a, a kind of slightly different argument. He's saying we need to actually kind of ground this in case law. We can't just simply say that you know these other cases were wrong. And then you know I would say you know this is, this of course is a constitutional. I, I, I confess full error. I said this is totally constitutional. Randy Barnett walks in and Todd goes to Randy. Hey Randy, you know uh, we have this healthcare law coming up. Uh, have you thought about it? Randy said, you know I haven't given it much thought. And this is Randy Barnett, the Godfather of the challenge. Said quote I haven't given it much thought. Which, which is simply stunning, but at the time he was dealing with privileges or immunities clause with Dollar Chicago and other stuff people don't really care about anymore. Okay? <laughs> but this was what was on his mind. And Todd goes, hey, listen, listen, I have a guy. And everyone in Washington that means I have a guy. I have a guy who can do a first, you know, could write something. And Randy says, okay, you know what? You do the first draft, and I'll come and take a look at it. Okay? And that guy, it was a guy named Nathaniel Stewart, who was a Washington lawyer at the time. And Nate Stewart, interestingly enough, had written a note under John Adler, another uh, 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 George Mason grad. And in, in uh, uh, law school, he wrote a, a law review note. And he's looking at the case of Gonzales and Raich, and he made an interesting observation. He said, in Raich, they keep using this phrase, activities, activities, activities. What Nathaniel Stewart said was, what the court said can be regulated are certain classes of activities, right? But what he implied is if something's outside a class of activity, inactivity, Congress can't regulate it. And it was this subtle insight that actually gave you know, a solid constitutional footing to Barnett's argument. It wasn't just saying Congress can't regulate activity. That's, you know, that, that's a good argument, but where's the law? This was basing on reach. Okay? And then uh, Gaziano and, and uh, Nate Stewart did the first draft, and I had the red lines, Randy went back and forth. And on uh, December something, they actually, four weeks later, they published this white paper for Heritage. And this is actually an event where Eugene Vollett, another former, uh, I think he visited here at George Mason, uh, uh, gave a talk at uh, Heritage with uh, Randy Barnett. Uh, and interestingly enough, Warren Hatch was there too. And Warren Hatch absolutely loved this report. Warren Hatch said, uh, you know, this is a good idea. Because after that time, there have been no good ideas in Capitol Hill of why this law is unconstitutional. So within hours of this Heritage White paper being released, that report was read to the congressional record. So this was the transfer from the academy to politics. And it was very fast. This might be the quickest citation by the United States Congress of any academic publication ever. It was a few hours. Um, and remarkably, that paper set the tenor for the debate of why this was unconstitutional. Um, so it really began fortuitously. Um, I, I don't know if Todd had it, did what he did when he did it, if someone could have come, come up with this otherwise. Now there were efforts in the states to try to challenge this, but the states were, you know, they're, they're not they're not constitutional theorists. They don't have that grounding. So they really took what, what Randy wrote, also what David Rifkin wrote, and kind of ran with it. But it was, that, it was that academic start. I think Ilya had a good post about this uh, on the Volokh Conspiracy, an excerpt from his book about the importance of having a strong constitutional theory uh, behind this. It's not just politics. You need to have a strong theory and doctrine and a way to actually persuade a judge that there's a reason why it's unconstitutional. And that's how it went off to the races. Ilya, you want to? I, I mean, I would just add just that there's two sort of factual equations. One is political. Obviously, Republicans hated this. Moreover, it was also unpopular with the general public, so they were very motivated to bring the lawsuit. If this had been a bipartisan law which had broad support, very unlikely the Supreme Court would have struck it down, no matter how good the legal arguments uh, were. However, the legal argument was also significant in it to winning court. You also have to have arguments that A, will seem credible to experts, judges, and others, B, uh, ideally we want something that will have to overrule as little Supreme Court precedent as possible. And the argument that Randy, David Rifkin, and others came up with uh, fit that bill well. It was credible to experts, uh, and also it did not require overruling any Supreme Court precedent, or at least on its face it didn't. There was a lot of argument about whether it would require an overruling precedent, or obviously the defender of the law said precedent does control this. But the more you look at that precedent, and the more you saw what went on in the lower courts, or even the lower court opinions upholding the mandate, they all went on for 20 or 30 pages as to the reasoning, the more it became clear that the precedent was at the very least ambiguous, and that therefore you could interpret it in such a way that you could strike this thing down while leaving it intact. And I think that was sort of Randy's role, and also to some extent the role of the Bola conspiracy. We popularized and made clear to the experts that there really was this argument that could not easily be dismissed and that you could strike this down but not overturn cases like Wickard and Raich, which by the way many of us would have been very happy to overturn, but uh, it was unlikely that the Supreme Court would do that. So the only chance of winning show there's an argument that doesn't require overruling these things, but that would also be able to strike down a mandate. And a note to all of you students, this can be you one day, right? <laughs> this is why con law is an important class to have, right? To come up with these arguments 
requires a lot of thought and intelligence and thinking. This didn't come out of like, you know, a Lawrence Tribe Treatise or like, you know, an Erwin Chemerinsky textbook. This came out of students who thought about the Constitution a different way. And, and I, I really hasten to think of what happened if Todd and Nate and all the things didn't come together when they did. Because if this law would have passed without a constitutional challenge in place, what would the complaint have said? Would the proper arguments have been raised? Okay, that's why it's important. Yes, sir. Well, I guess I'm just wondering, like, I mean, did, <laughs> was there any ever pointing out that the, the argument that this was based on those, those prior cases, the, the, the facts seem so stretched. So the, the original concept came from them saying, you know, growing your own wheat is, is interference on interstate commerce, and then we're gonna take that and stretch that to a point where we're gonna use the same argument to mandate people to buy a particular product. I mean, I, I understand that they're trying to apply the same the same principle, but at some point don't you have to take back, look at it in like common sense and say <laughs> saying you can you, you, you can't grow so much wheat on your own property is, is very different than saying you have to buy something. So what sounds like common sense depends to some extent on your starting point here. Uh, so for the our side of this case, the common sense is that it's is that even growing wheat has only a, on your own land to feed your own cows only a dubious connection to interstate commerce. Not having health insurance even less connection. The other side's common sense is that uh, the power to regulate interstate commerce is really the power to engage in any regulations, and it would have any kind of significant effect on interstate commerce. Wheat can be covered because growing wheat has an effect on interstate commerce. Similarly, not having health insurance, which the other, well, the other side, one of the other side's mantra, surely healthcare is an industry that's one sixth of the economy, right? Surely, if you can regulate anything on interstate commerce, you can regulate that. And if you can regulate that, then you can regulate other stuff that may not itself be interstate commerce, but has an effect on it, including inaction as well as action. Uh, so, what you really have here is two competing visions of constitutional federalism. One which says that uh, it should be interpreted broadly so that anything that's in one of Congress's enumerated powers, Congress can regulate anything that has any significant effect on it, especially in a modern world where everything is interconnected. The other vision that says it's very important to maintain limits on federal power and therefore we should interpret these things in a more narrow kind of a way. Maybe there are some precedents which violated that that we can't overrule, but we should interpret those precedents themselves relatively narrowly so to be consistent with a limited government vision of federalism rather than one that says that the federal government has the power to uh, solve anything that might be considered as a national problem. Or maybe it's just unprecedented. <laughs> uh, that, one, one more question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, maybe, maybe I should know the answer to this, but wasn't there a uh, legal challenge on the way that this bill was passed through the separate houses on yes. origination clause? Yes, yes, yes there is. That? So that's the case of Sissel uh, uh, before Sibelius. And actually, it's, it's on appeal to the DC Circuit now, right? So, so the Constitution says taxes must originate in the house, right? Okay. When this law was passed, it wasn't a tax, so it began in the Senate. Well, John Roberts said this is a tax. So our friends at the Pacific Legal Foundation brought a suit saying, if this is in fact a tax, it would have had to, burn, it would have had to begin in the house, okay? It didn't begin in the house, so therefore it's unconstitutional. Uh, the district court dismissed it, and I don't know the arguments well, but it's called a shell bill, mm -hmm. where effectively there was some bill that actually began in the house, it was a shell, then it was sent back to the Senate, and I don't know, Ilya, do you know more about this? I, I haven't followed it too closely. Yeah, so, so there are various complexities here, uh, and you know, the origination clause has not been much litigated in modern times, much less so than commerce, necessary and proper, or even the tax clause. So if this does gain some steam, uh, it you know, be interesting to see what happens out of it. There are sort of various technical arguments uh, that the other side can make. John, Josh mentioned one of them, but here, in a sense, the common sense side, the common sense, if there is any common sense, is on the side of the challengers in that it seems like this attacks, if it didn't originate in the House, then, uh, you know, then it should have originated in the House. Uh, my initial take on this lawsuit when it first happened was like, there's no way the Supreme Court will want to take this because they thought that they had, uh, you know, they thought that they had gotten rid of this hot potato, right? And they wouldn't want to bring it up again. But the more political problems Obamacare has, the more the court might be willing to step in and say, you know, if we really do believe that the origination clause bars this, that uh, maybe it does violate the origination clause. I think on balance, it's still not likely that this will get to the Supreme Court and succeed, but recent events make the chances a bit higher than they were before. If, 
if the circuit if a circuit court were to say that it violates the origination clause and nullifies it whereas the supreme court had upheld it do you think that would make it more likely to so so court? if any circuit court anywhere does strike this down based on the origination clause then that would almost certainly mean that the supreme court would take the case yeah because they're not going to allow a situation where the statute is not valid in some parts of the country but is valid in others that would be a really big at the deal, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it would render, and I'm going to go close to that note, it will render the entire Affordable Care Act impotent. I mean, it's going to be like bottle. It just it will not work. And um, yeah. so, so, so if a court of appeals does strike this down, that means it would go to the Supreme Court. If the court- If John Roberts would bite the apple, right? <laughs> yeah. So John Roberts, John Roberts would then pretty much have to bite the apple, even if he would prefer to uh, pass it along, right? Uh, no, but that was a penalty. <laughs> so I was just kidding, it was actually a penalty. <laughs> so, in theory, uh, notice that to avoid constitutional problems, he construed it as a tax, even though he said it's not the most natural yes. reading. He could then say, well, for purpose of this challenge, we're going to construe it as a penalty so to avoid this constitutional problem. And one issue I'm not sure the Supreme Court has ever resolved is whether you can sort of, to avoid constitutional problems, you can construe something in one in one way, in, another, in one case, another way, in another one. But I should stress all this is hypothetical until a circuit court does, in fact, that, that'll, that'll be for the unprecedented people. Yes, so, yeah, so yeah. I suspect there's going to be a second edition of this book, yeah. even regardless, but there will most definitely be a second edition if the Supreme Court takes the, uh, uh, the origination clause case. Right. That I can guarantee you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, I can hang around for a few more minutes as well. I think we have the room, but uh, well, thank you. Should I? Thanks again for coming out, everybody. Appreciate it. Do you yeah. have mixed time? Thank you so much.